Great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning for our virtual forum on offshore wind transmission in New York State. Whether you are in New York or out of state or international, we had a tremendous interest in this uh, panel this morning. We're very excited about it. My name is Julie Tai. I'm president of the New York League of Conservation Voters Education Fund. We're happy to be joined by our event partners and Barrick and the Satan Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School. In particular, we want to thank our event sponsor, Con Edison. NYLCV Education's Fund mission is to educate, engage, and empower New Yorkers to be effective advocates for the environment. This forum is the first in our series on New York's climate, Ambitious Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, or the CLCPA, building on an event we held with the Sabin Center last fall, providing a 10,000 foot overview of the all encompassing law to move to a green economy. Through this series, our goal is to build public awareness and educate New Yorkers on climate action, as well as develop recommendation on how to achieve its objectives in a way that is efficient and equitable. We will hold more in the future to talk about how we green our transportation sector, tackle building and manufacturing emissions, and take advantage of the carbon sinking properties of nature and agriculture. One of the most important steps we can take to reduce the effects of climate change, and a critical first step needed to address the, all of the other sectors, is to switch our energy sources to renewables. The CLCPA legally commits New York to this priority, with a mandate of obtaining 70% of its power from renewable sources in just 10 years, and includes the largest offshore wind goals in the country. Building on that law, this year, the state took further action by adopting the Accelerated Energy Growth and Community Benefit Act to streamline the siting process for large-scale renewable energy. And last month, Governor Cuomo announced the largest combined solicitations for renewable energy ever issued in the US. But there's much more work still to be done. To realize the benefit of renewables, we need a modern transmission system. One of the barriers to renewable energy siting that we identified and are breaking down the barriers to renewable energy white paper and recommendations issued in 2019. The proposed South Fork wind farm off the coast of Long Island shows us that transmission is an important challenge to switching to renewable energy. And that's what we're here to talk about today. What should be done to get this energy to land and to the people who need it? Is a planned approach to transmission or project by project transmission approach the way to go? This forum will look at different considerations and points of view for how we get this energy to the grid. We'll hear from the Brattle Group who was commissioned by Embarrick to do a report on the different approaches to transmission. But before we get to this analysis, I would like to introduce our moderator today. We're happy to be joined by my friend and former boss, Joe Martens, the director of the New York Offshore Wind Alliance. At NIOA, Joe promotes policies that will lead to the responsible development of offshore wind. Previously, Joe served as commissioner of the State Department of Environmental Conservation. During his time at DEC, he led the department in banning hydraulic fracturing, expanding the state's protection for open spaces, safeguarding drinking water, and improving air quality. He also served as the, on the board of the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, or NYSERDA. Before joining DEC, Joe served as president of the Open Space Institute, which protects and helps preserve thousands of acres of, of New York parkland. Please join me in welcoming Joe Martens. Good morning, everyone. And Julie, thank you for that very nice introduction. Uh, I indeed was Julie's boss for uh, several years at DEC, where Julie, uh, Julie was a walking encyclopedia of the uh, ECL, or Environmental Conservation Law. She uh, was as responsible for anyone in the department for all the things that we accomplished uh, while I was commissioner from 2011 to 2015. So thank you, Julie. Thank you to the uh, League of Conservation Voters for sponsoring the event, along with the Sabin Center and Embarek. And thanks to Con Ed, the sponsor. Uh, this is indeed a really important topic. And I'm gonna try to, just in a couple of minutes before I uh, introduce the Brattle panel, set the stage for uh, how we got where we are today in New York. And it has been, uh, in a word, an energy revolution or rather a clean energy revolution in New York State. So I'm gonna run through very quickly a, a chronology that, that I put together uh, before this morning's, uh, before we started the webinar this morning. Um, uh, and there's lots of reasons why we're going through this energy revolution. And I would say the, you know, the, the primary one is climate change and the IPCC report of several years ago that alerted the world 
to how fast climate change was happening. I think it defied even the experts' predictions uh, for how quickly the, the planet was warming. And um, it, that in combination with uh, basically a stalemate in Washington, some would say uh, backsliding in Washington, uh, it was really left up to the states to step up to the plate and address the issue. And I will say that New York State uh, acted in spades. So um, in 2015, as Julie mentioned, uh, we banned fracking in New York and I signed the finding statement in August of 2015. And I think that really sort of was arguably the beginning of this uh, transition to clean energy in New York. It was a obviously a very difficult decision, took us years to render, but I think it was absolutely the right decision. Uh, in 2015 and during my years at Commissioner, uh, we barely talked about offshore wind. I think we were all vaguely aware of uh, what was going on with Cape Wind in Massachusetts, but it was not a central topic for us in New York. So I, uh, I left the commissioner's seat in 20, August of 2015. And in 2016, uh, the governor did a couple of things in his state of the state. First, he called for a 50% renewable energy goal by 2030. He also called for an offshore wind master plan, which was really the first large mention of offshore wind in New York state. And the other big event in 2016 was that Equinor won the lease in the New York bite for about 80,000 acres um, for an offshore wind farm at what was then a staggering price of $42 million, which obviously showed that there was corporate interest in offshore wind in the US, despite what happened to Cape Wind after 10 years. In 2017, the Governor Cuomo called for 2,400 megawatt offshore wind goal and he also called on the Long Island Power Authority to approve a contract for a 90 megawatt offshore wind project to power the South Fork of Long Island. That project has since grown to 130 megawatts. In 2018, again at the state of the state, the governor called for an offshore wind solicitation of at least 800 megawatts. And the offshore wind master plan was published just about the same time at the state of the state. And it was one of the most comprehensive documents I have seen produced by a state that basically gave a roadmap uh, how to get to 2,400 megawatts by 2030, excuse me, by 2035. Uh, that plan was published with about 20 appendices that examined virtually every aspect of offshore wind. 2019, Governor Cuomo announced his Green New Deal for New York and he proposed a 70 by 30 renewable energy goal uh, which basically doubled onshore solar, wind, and storage targets. And he also called for a 9,000 megawatt standard for offshore wind, which left a lot of people speechless, uh, myself included. So later that year, uh, 29, we're still in 2019, uh, the governor and the legislature agreed to landmark legislation that Julie referred to as the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, known as the CLCPA. It was sweeping legislation and it incorporated many of the governor's uh, Green New Deal goals and put them in statute for the first time in New York. Uh, historically, New York has set virtually all of its uh, energy goals through the Public Service Commission and through orders that the PSC issues. This time the legislature got in on the action and they uh, memorialized in statute the 70 by 30 goal uh, and it did a lot of other things and addressed a lot of other issues, which we won't discuss today and which the league has held forms on in the past. He also announced at the same time that he signed that bill, uh, the award of the two first two large scale commercial contracts uh, that the state was entering into. And they were for an 880 megawatt project uh, known as Sunrise Wind and an 816 megawatt project known as Empire Wind by Equinor. And the latter, the, the Sunrise project was uh, Orsted. These were the largest uh, solicitations awards at the time in the country. And those projects are moving along in the permitting process. 
And that almost brings us to the present. Uh, 2020, the, the, uh, in the budget process this year, the legislature, and this is in the middle of the pandemic, the legislature and the governor agreed to major reforms on renewable energy siting, as Julie also noted. I will call it the Accelerated Renewable Energy Act because I can't remember the formal long name or the acronym. But in addition to completely rewriting the way uh, renewable energy is cited in New York and establishing very strict timetables, which was in, by and large an acknowledgement that we were really good at New York at entering into contracts, but not so good citing and build, getting projects built. After all, uh, we, have, we are about at 27% renewable penetration in the electricity uh, sector today in New York, and 20% of that is legacy hydro projects upstate. So we have a long way to go. But these goals uh, that were set in the CLCPA really uh, provide a path for us to get there. So the siting law, uh, in addition to, again, rewriting how uh, renewable energy projects are cited, uh, also called for a study of the transmission system in recognition that we can build all of the uh, renewable generation we want, but if we can't get, get it to the places where it's needed, particularly downstate where the largest demand is in New York City and Long Island, uh, we are literally uh, spinning our wheels. So uh, transmission was acknowledged as a very important piece of this puzzle. And the uh, siting law court called for the PSC to do a study of the complete system, both onshore and offshore in 270 days, which it brings us really to the end of this year. Um, I think as everybody who has worked or dealt with government before knows, uh, these are unbelievably quick timetables. Uh, and I don't envy the PSC, but they have done a spectacular job of moving the process along. And as Julie noted, uh, they have started, the PSC has started a proceeding uh, to, to lay out how we can get to 70 by 30. And they recently released a white paper laying out a proposal uh, that will get us from where we are today to 70% by 2030. And one of the big questions in that uh, white paper that was raised would uh, was regarding the second solicitation for offshore wind, which was also recently authorized by the PSC for up to 2,500 megawatts, which would make it uh, the largest solicitation ever in the US. So one of the big questions uh, was, how do we approach transmission in this second solicitation? Uh, the first solicitation, it was decided that a so-called radial system where the developer designs and builds the transmission just to accommodate their project. It was decided that was the right approach because we don't have any commercial scale offshore wind projects to date. And we wanted to get the program up and running as quickly as possible. But even during the phase one uh, solicitation, the question was raised, well, uh, should we be looking at a network system to, since we anticipate uh, multiple projects being built, not only off New York, but across our sister states to the north and south. So the, um, the conclusion over uh, uh, in the white paper, and I shouldn't say it's a conclusion because the white paper was a proposal and uh, many groups, including NIOA, commented on that white paper. But uh, the white paper proposed that for the time being that <clears throat> the potential for a backbone network remains speculative, or I say a backward network, they're all, we, we call it a lot of different, different things, but it's a network system, a coordinated system, uh, that it was still premature and it was too speculative at this point, primarily because there was still a lot of uncertainty about um, where new wind energy areas would be located and how soon they would be, be leased in the New York bite. And that is a federal process that's under the jurisdiction of the Bureau of Offshore Energy Management. So in light of the uncertainty involved, the second solicitation um, is again calling for the developers to design a radial approach, which is basically connect the offshore wind farm to the onshore grid 
by a single transmission line from that single project. But nonetheless, the white paper acknowledged that this is still a very important issue and needed to, to continue to be studied. And that is where um, today's discussion is going to lead us, this is a discussion of a radial system versus a coordinated system. And the Brattle Group, uh, which is one of the premier energy consultants in the country, uh, on behalf of ANBARIC has looked into this issue. They've, they've done a study in Massachusetts um, and they've initiated a study in New York to, to feed into the process that's underway at the PSC to come to grips with all a host of transmission issues by the end of this year. So I want to introduce the, uh, the Brattle Group, um, who is going to talk about the findings of their study and the, the relative merits of the you know, radial approach versus the coordinated approach. So let me grab my notes. So Hannes Feifenberger is the principal at the Brattle Group. Uh, he is an economist with a background in electrical engineering and over 25 years of experience in the areas of regula <coughs> excuse me, regulatory economics and finance. Dr. Walter Graff is an associate at the Brattle Group with expertise in ex electricity wholesale market design and analysis, load forecasting and rate design. And finally, Kasparis Spokus is an associate at the Brattle Group with a focus on electricity sector topics such as renewable and climate policy analysis, electricity policy design, and market design. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the Brattle Group. And following uh, their presentation, we will have a panel discussion about not only the Brattle study, but some broader issues. And we will try to reserve about 15 minutes at the end of the panel discussion for questions uh, from all of you. And uh, you can use the chat function to uh, start asking your questions, uh, which we'll address at the end. And I uh, should have pointed out in the beginning that the, this presentation, the entire webinar will be uh, videoed um, or recorded rather, and it will be available on the uh, NYLCV website following uh, the, web, the webcast. So with that, I am going to turn it over to the Brattle Group and uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, can folks hear me and see me? Um, assuming I can be heard and seen. Um, you sound good, Hans. Uh, Great, thank you so much. This is Hannes Pfeifenberger. As I said, I, I'm from the Brattle Group. I'm based in Boston. I am not from Boston, nor I'm from New York. If you uh, detect an accent, it's from, from Austria, where I grew up, landlocked country. But um, we do a lot in hydro and onshore wind and solar. But I've been here for 30 years, and uh, the coastline in uh, New England, New York, and the Mid-Atlantic states has fantastic wind resources. So let's uh, talk a little bit more about the study that uh, we've just put together uh, for UNBARIC. The next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, Joe obviously did a great introduction of where New York is, but as you know, there are several decarbonization studies and they'll find about the same results. And the results are to achieve New York's ambitious clean energy goals will require a lot of renewable energy. More than 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind is likely. And now we're talking just about the 9,000 megawatts that we committed, but uh, this study by a colleague of ours found that it's more likely that uh, we need between 14,000 and 24,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2040. So whatever we do now to accommodate 9,000 megawatts might only be the starting point of trying to get to the clean energy goals. Um, next slide, please. So Unbarak has been studying that with some engineering consultants and so 
um, cabling ocean bed um, marine uh, consultants for about a year, and they retained us to look at uh, that ongoing work uh, and compare the costs and benefits of different offshore transmission options in an attempt to contribute to the discussion that is already happening in New York. Because New York has less coastline than some of the other states in the mid-Atlantic and northeastern U.S., um, transmission has been discussed in New York from the very beginning. So what we're doing here is simply contribute to that ongoing discussion. But we've quantitatively and qualitatively examined two approaches. The one approach is the generator lead line. Joe mentioned uh, the radial approach that where every wind farm is connected with its own transmission line to shore and integrated into the onshore grid. And, uh, and um, an alternative plant approach where um, multiple wind farms would share a combined offshore onshore transmission infrastructure. Um, it is perfectly common and normal to use the generator lead line approach or GLL approach. Uh, initially, it certainly that's how it happened for onshore wind. That's how it happened for offshore wind initially in Europe. But Europe has already moved beyond that. Most of the new wind that gets built in Europe is uh, uh, using a planned transmission network that serves multiple wind farms at a time. And it's certainly also true for onshore wind in the US. Uh, Texas, of all places, a decade ago has started to plan an onshore transmission grid, and they completed that onshore transmission grid capable of integrating 18,000 megawatts of onshore wind into the Texas power market, and those 18,000 megawatts are more than fully subscribed already. Next slide. So, to give you a short preview before I turn it over to my colleagues, um, what we found by comparing those two approaches is that a planned approach would allow you to reduce total transmission costs. You spend more money on the offshore network, but you reduce dramatically the cost of the onshore upgrades compared to a radial or GLL approach with a net savings of about half a billion dollars uh, by the time you reach 9,000 megawatts. Um, the planned approach allows you to utilize points of interconnection more efficiently. Uh, New York has some severe limitations. Uh, trying to get cables through the narrows, for example, is uh, a real challenge. And it is necessary, though, to reach some of the onshore grid. Um, as these maps show, and you'll see in, in greater detail, a radial approach would need about 18 individual cables, whereas a planned approach might only use five. Uh, that means less environmental impact, less trenching in the ocean, fewer cable miles, uh, reduced impact on fishing, coastal communities, and uh, all together. And what we also see in those engineering studies uh, done by, on behalf of Enbaric, is that Getting to 9,000 megawatts, the onshore grid is not sufficiently strong to accommodate that, and you will see severe curtailments of the uh, wind power. But with that, let me turn it over to my colleagues who can give you more detail. Thank you. Good morning again. Uh, my name is Walter Graf, and uh, thank you, Hannes. Uh, if you could go on to the next slide or two. So thanks so much. So before diving into the results, I'd like to spend just a few minutes discussing the methodology and the approach that we used in this study. So just to set a little bit of context, we looked at the additional offshore wind and the additional transmission that's required to meet New York's current 9,000 megawatt goal. As of today, New York has already contracted just over 1,800 megawatts uh, from Empire, Sunrise, and South Fork Wind. So for the purposes of this study, we'll call that phase one. And we assume that these already selected projects would proceed 
as planned with generator lead lines under both approaches. And so then we focus this study on what we call phases two and three, which are the additional 2400, then 27 or 2800 megawatts needed to reach the, the, the overall goal. And for this, the additional transmission, we compare two scenarios for future development. These are meant to be illustrative or perhaps indicative scenarios representing the current approach and the alternative planned approach. Note that NYSERDA has recently announced that they would procure the next 1,000 to 2,500 megawatts using the current generator lead line approach. We don't yet know what they will procure, but we hope that they'll use the points of interconnection efficiently and in the broader context of a long-term plan like we talk about here. So in that context, we included all not yet contracted wind and transmission in this study. And by the way, we, we also assume that BOEM, uh, the Bureau of uh, Ocean and uh, Energy Management finalizes and leases uh, the wind energy areas in the New York Bight before phase three. Otherwise, you, uh, you just can't really get to 9,000 megawatts. Um, next slide, please. So how did we come up with the transmission scenarios that we used to represent the generator lead line and plan scenarios? So we, we certainly didn't do it alone. And I'd like to point out, like Thomas said, that we've had a lot of support from other consultants. In particular, and Barrick hired Pitera, an electric power and transmission planning consultant, PSC, a power systems and costing expert, and Intertech, another international consultancy um, that works on utility inner ties and offshore wind and other offshore cabling questions. They, they help to address various cable routing questions. And altogether, they've been working on various analyses, including power systems simulation, power flow analyses, production simulation, um, simulations of operation and curtailment and so on. So it's in, in that broader context that uh, really together we designed two representative scenarios and we certainly tried to do that in a fair way objectively and to represent really what's the most likely to occur under each planning approach and accounting for the big uncertainties of, of what could happen in the future. So collectively what this group did was to identify all of the substations at 69 kilovolts and above that could be accessible for injecting offshore wind from lease areas. We found 22 of those and, and they're on the map there. Um, then our engineering partners at Pitera conducted studies to identify the maximum amount of energy that each point of interconnection could accept. And they conducted studies of the upgrade needed under various sequences of interconnection to get to the nine gigawatt target. And really only after studying many, many potential approaches and many necessary upgrades did we identify two scenarios to reflect first the planned transmission development that minimizes overall cost, and then two, a potential outcome of the current approach where each incremental interconnection is done at the lowest possible cost for that piece, but maybe not at the lowest possible cost overall. Um, we also made sure to, uh, that physical constraints were, were met to the cable approach routes, especially in the narrows, and Caspers will discuss that in a little bit. Um, and P then PSC conducted detailed cost estimates for the two scenarios, and we then evaluated the non-cost advantages of dis and disadvantages, including evaluating curtailment through production simulations. So really there's a lot of moving pieces to the study. More details, um, of course, can be found in the full online version of the study. What we're showing here is just a, um, a condensed version. And then uh, I, I think those links will be available after the, the presentation, as well as links to the various appendices by other consultants. Uh, next slide, please. So in this map, we show what we chose as the plausible or likely build out of the current generator lead line approach with seven additional projects interconnecting to New York through HVAC lines. In phases two and three, like Hannah said, this implies 18 new cables from the various lease areas, some of which go to New York, uh, uh, to New York City, and most interconnecting in Long Island. Under this approach, there's, there's really quite a lot of cables snaking around everywhere to get to shore. Uh, but if each developer chooses to interconnect to the next cheapest point of interconnection, this outcome we think is, is fairly likely. 
or something like this. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as you can see here in the map of the likely transmission build out with a plan system and with high capacity HVDC cables, you only need five additional lines in phases two and three. And this is really a huge difference. It means lower environmental impact. It means fewer disruptive onshore cable landings, And it means more power getting to the large load centers near New York City rather than farther out in Long Island where the power grid isn't as robust. I do want to note that um, we, that the large injections at Gowanus and at Fresh Kills, which are two locations near New York City, are higher than New York's current single contingency limit. And this, so this, the, the single contingency limit is, is a current limit for how much power can be accepted in a single injection location and can be subject to disconnection from a single failure. Um, and the, the, the current limit is lower than either the 1700 megawatts or 12 or 2000 megawatts that we're assumed that we're assuming can be injected there. We think it's worthwhile to consider uh, reconsider this limit given the implied reductions in cabling and in costs. But of course, we do recognize that allowing larger contingencies does have costs and it has consequences. But we think that there's, there's reason to believe that this could be loosened in the future given New York's substantial battery storage goals where fast response from batteries and other quick responding resources other evolutions of the system that are necessary anyways to integrate large amounts of renewable energy. Altogether, this should make relaxing the single contingency limit possible. Um, and I think at this point, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Kaspers. Thanks very much. Thanks, Walter. Next slide, please. So over the next couple of slides, uh, we're going to dig into some of the findings of the analyses. Starting with costs, the analyses show that the total transmission costs of the next 7,200 megawatts are expected to be $500 million lower under a planned approach than the gener generator lead line approach. The main driver of this is a reduction in onshore upgrade costs, which are 500 million under the planned approach versus 2 billion under the GLL approach. So while offshore transmission equipment in the planned approach would be more costly, primarily due to the use of HVDC transmission technology. The onshore savings lead to overall cost reductions of transmission. Now the uncertainty bars reflect uncertainty both for the offshore and the onshore transmission costs. And so when we look at it overall, the planned approach can enable significant long-term cost savings and avoid some of the substantial risks associated with onshore upgrades also allow developers to anticipate future projects to minimize project risk. Not considered on the slide, um, but should be mentioned is that competitive procurement of transmission can also lead to additional cost savings under the planned approach of 20 to 30 percent simply from increased competition. Next slide, please. Another finding of the analyses is that there are simply a limited number of robust points of interconnection in New York. So a separate GLL approach risks using up the viable landing sites inefficiently and resulting in cable routing that could become quite constrained. A planned approach would likely result in better utilization of these cable routes. And the clearest example of this is through the Narrows in the New York Harbor. And Barrett contracted a study by Intertech to evaluate cabling through the narrows, and that will be found in one of the attachments of the published slide deck. Analyses show that the narrows is quite constrained due to just simply the physical width of the seabed, uh, federal navigation project like channels and anchorages, cable spacing requirements, and other competing uses that result in only space for about four offshore wind cables. Now, two AC cables are already planned by Empire Wind, to go through the narrows. And so the planned approach utilizes the remaining space for two DC cables that would total 3,200 megawatts. Now the GLL approach risks using the remaining space for two AC cables that would bring in 800 megawatts, which would push about uh, 2,400 megawatts to Long Island where more substantial onshore upgrades would be required. 
So planning transmission through the narrows to efficiently utilize this route is a great example of a critical topic that likely deserves early and focused attention from state planners. Next slide, please. So the planning approach can also reduce the environmental impact of developing offshore wind. We see that the planned approach reduces marine trenching by almost 60% and cable landings by 54% for the next 7,200 megawatts. Furthermore, offshore cables could be grouped into transmission corridors to minimize impact, which is not possible to enforce under the GLL approach. Overall, this reduces the cumulative effects onshore development on fisheries, coastal communities, and the marine environment. Next slide, please. Regarding curtailment, production simulation analyses uh, present several interesting findings. With 4,200 megawatts assumed in service after phase two, the total curtailments under the planned approach are significantly less at 0.1% um, in the planned approach than in the GLO approach, uh, which has 4.2% curtailments. However, once development is at nine gigawatts of service in 2035 after phase three, the preliminary analysis here indicates that much higher levels of curtailment in both approaches at 18.2% in the GLL approach and 18% in the planned approach. Now, this result shows that more planning work needs to be done to configure transmission to minimize curtailment. It highlights a key topic that requires more attention from transmission planners. The analyses in the study did evaluate elective upgrades to reduce curtailments uh, under nine gigawatts to 14% in both scenarios and found that the costs are $550 million more under the GLL approach to reach that level of curtailment. So overall, this just highlights that um, a key topic that requires planners' attention as planning can uh, further configure transmission that can reduce curtailments. In addition, we note that um, planning could integrate uh, New York's three gigawatt storage goal with offshore transmission to further reduce curtailments and minimize upgrade needs and lastly, that um, planning could enable networking of HVDC cables that could move injection to less congested points of interconnection and just reduce the risk of transmission outages. Next slide, please. So just summarizing the key conclusions. Uh, next slide. Overall, we see that uh, a plan approach uh, improves outcomes across seven criteria, the first five of which I've discussed in the previous slide. It saves money by avoiding expensive onshore upgrades, it can reduce marine cabling and landing points to reduce impacts on the environment. It can reduce curtailments in the short term and enable further system planning to mitigate curtailment in the long term. And um, through competitive procurement, competition can drive to lower cost. Importantly, um, it enables planners to efficiently utilize corridors um, and constrain landing points, such as the narrows. Not covered in these slides here, but available in the detailed study slides that will be published after this webinar. Um, the plan approach can also improve the utilization of existing lease areas and enable third-party customers to purchase offshore wind, such as large commercial customers, um, as we've seen in Europe um, with Microsoft and Google purchasing offshore wind. Next slide, please. And so because of the results found in the analysis, um, we see that a planned approach can offer significant advantages. While the generator lead line approach may appear to lower costs in the short run, um, it may not be aligned with public interest in the long run. And so we know that even if NYSERDA does the next procurement as a bundled procurement, it could still give preference for generators that use uh, points of interconnection efficiently, and that this transmission could be transitioned to a planned open access grid. Under this approach, uh, we note that offshore wind generator developers would still be able to participate in transmission development uh, with either functional or physical separation of the transmission and generator generation um, assets. And we note that project on project risk has been cited as a concern. But the current GLL approach 
um, still leaves significant onshore upgrades with the incumbent onshore transmission owners, which is a risk. And the misalignment between generation developer incentives and public policy objectives risks the overall development of offshore wind in New York. And, and a plan approach can also address some of the individual project on projects risk through strong performance and completion incentives, um, allowing generation developers to participate in the transmission procurements and possibly staggering transmission and generation project uh, completion timeframes to ensure um, that there aren't any sort of delays in project completion. And that leads us to the end of our slides. So thank you. I believe we have a short uh, Q&A session um, right now. Oh, Joe, Joe, I believe you're on mute. You're correct. I was. I still haven't mastered the Zoom audio. So thank you um, to all the Brattle Group. That was a, obviously an uh, intriguing presentation. Um, and I am looking over the, through the uh, questions that were incoming during your presentation, uh, some of which I think were answered online. Uh, in fact, so one of the questions uh, that I see is, would funding differ under the GLL versus planned approach and who pays for transmission costs? Yeah, Joe, that is a very good question. Uh, this is Hannes Pfeffenberger. I mean, ultimately, New York customers will have to pay for offshore wind and all the transmission, whether onshore and, and offshore. Um, how it gets paid at, and how much you pay at one point in time differs under the two approaches. Um, generally, uh, if you do a radial approach, the cost of transmission, just the offshore piece is rolled into the bid. So customers pay for that transmission as part of the contract for the offshore wind. And they will pay for the onshore upgrades as part of the New York ISO uh, tariff and planning process, unless the onshore upgrades are already part of the offshore interconnection process. Um, one of the benefits of the um, planned grid is that it allows to decouple that from the projects wind projects last about um, 20 years. So if you have a bundled approach, you have to pay for the transmission over that 20 year uh, contract. Uh, transmission, however, lasts much longer. The current system that we are using, the current grid <clears throat> is already 40, 50, 60 years old or older in some cases. So a planned approach would allow you to recover the cost of the transmission over say a 40 year period instead of a 20 year period. So there's a, a less of a near term cost recovery need because the future customers who would continue to benefit from that grid would share a larger portion of those costs. Thanks, Hannes. So I'm not, so we, we're at 10.51, we're a little bit behind, but um, I have another question here uh, concerning, which is what has the European experience been with both planned and GLL radial approaches? And what are seen as the strength and weaknesses of different approaches in the EU? That is uh, a really excellent question. Um, NIPA, has actually done a, a white paper uh, surveying the European experience. And uh, you know, maybe we can add a link to that. Uh, the European experience is that the first few projects are using radial lines, but as the solicitations have stepped up, uh, more of the projects have been built off a planned transmission backbone where um, the solicitations were for interconnecting to the offshore interconnection point provided by that grid. And uh, the UK is now going there. Uh, the uh, 
Dutch government has implemented that. Belgium, uh, Germany has done that. The first time when Germany tried to do that, it didn't go too well because the technology was not ready and the transmission uh, network was delayed, which uh, obviously is a very costly thing to have happened. But after that first uh, experience with HVDC technology, uh, the experience subsequently is much better. And being able to interconnect offshore and not have the wind developer worry about all the onshore um, congestion has also yielded more competitive offshore wind solicitations where um, the wind the winning bids did not require any financial support above market prices. Right. Thank you, Hannes. I, I'm going to, um, there, there's lots of incoming questions, all uh, very interesting. And I think we can, the panelists will also get a shot at some of the questions. And I just would like to remind people, I think I directed people to the chat function for um, proposing questions. If you wouldn't mind going to the Q and A, uh, it might be easier to keep track of them there. And because uh, we do have some help here trying to consolidate questions uh, so they can be addressed. But I'd like to thank the Brattle panel for uh, one, an excellent presentation. And this is, this is extraordinarily topical. And I think it's also going to be very helpful in the PSC's study uh, that's going to be completed by the end of this year. So thanks again to the Brattle panel. We're going to now turn to the panel. Um, so uh, if the panelists could um, enter and the Brattle group uh, go offline, we'll go to the next phase of the, uh, of the webcast. So let me introduce uh, the panel. Uh, we have Kevin Knobloch, who is the president of New York Ocean Grid, a, a uh, part of Ambaric. Tammy Mitchell is the director of office, the Office of Electric, Gas, and Water at the New York State Department of Public Service. Kirsty Townsend is the director, head of special projects for Orsted. And Garish Behal is vice president of project and business development for the New York Power Authority. Uh, I think we've got uh, just about every um, aspect we could hope for on a panel of this size. Um, as, I, as I noted earlier, the PSC has been uh, charged with really evaluating both the onshore and the offshore system. Uh, the New York Power Authority was granted new uh, statutory authorization in the uh, in the two acts that I mentioned earlier, the Climate Leadership and, and uh, Community Protection Act and new siting law. Um, and it also has the ability to uh, get directly involved in the construction and operation of transmission um, offshore and onshore. So uh, we, we're gonna hear a little bit about that. Uh, Kirsty Townsend with Orsted, um, We'd really like to get your views, Kirsty, on some of the risks involved with the planned system um, from the developer's perspective. As it's been noted uh, in the European experience did not go um, that well early on. I think there has been some progress made. And I think, again, there is an expectation that a planned system uh, at, at some point in time may be the right approach, but we obviously have to be very careful. So um, I'd like to, while I look at some of the questions, I'd like each of you to just take a minute or two and react to the, to the presentation made by panel and uh, by the panel uh, from Brattle. And maybe we'll, we will start with Kirsty from Orsted again because uh, I think it's important that the developer perspective uh, be presented about some of the you know, potential risks and project, particularly the project on project risks. So Kirsty, why don't you take a minute and uh, just give us your, your overall views. Thank you, Joe. Um, and thank you to Ambarek and the Brattle team for that study. Um, you, you know, it's easy for me to sit here and 
pick apart assumptions. I, I note from the Q&A the HVAC question is a big part of the assumptions piece and you know we we would all argue as developers that that we're moving to HVDC certainly for the size of projects and the distances relevant for New York. So I think although we could talk a lot about the the specific numbers and the assumptions to, that lead to the general conclusions I think it's probably more reasonable to step back and say you know for New York for the northeast of the US what is the right model going forward and I think certainly from Ursted's perspective in order to facilitate the nine gigawatts and beyond targets for New York we do need to move to some form of shared system um, we, we're aware of that we're, we're challenged now we think it's been the right model up until now um, but going forward the constraints for New York system both geographically and electrically will need that the concerns that I have is, is just really all about how we approach that, that we don't rush into it, that we understand the risks, we learn the lessons from Europe and we don't make the same mistakes over here. So that means we look at all the risks that the various parties are exposed to and we transparently mitigate those risks in order to make sure that the ratepayer isn't exposed to the big bills that the ratepayers in Germany were up until quite recently they were still getting multi-billion dollar bills as a result of delayed uh, shared transmission or outages or failures of those outages and although the UK it was mentioned you know the UK as you can tell from accent it's it's a system I know extremely well we are now at the point where we're saturating that UK grid and therefore the need to look forward to a shared system is is, is prevalent and it will probably take us five to ten years to really develop something and get something into the water and that kind of time frame is why we need to be thinking about it now we don't have shared offshore standards here in the US for offshore grid HVDC technology is long procurement lead times with relatively few suppliers so we need to move now to establish all of that have the plan so that we can site this shared infrastructure in the right way and that we, we know the, the risks that we're gonna be exposed to. So we as developers don't price them in or, or, or you know, those risks are actually properly managed in the supply chain. So we don't risk failure to meet the targets altogether. So Joe, I hope that gives a, a pretty balanced view from a developer perspective. Uh, I, I can happily talk more about the specific risks and costs that we faced over in Europe and that we face here in the US, but I am uh, keen to give, uh, Kevin and Tammy and others on the panel, give it a, a chance to respond. Thanks very much, Kirsty. You, I think you hit the nail on the head in the short, in the few minutes that you had. So, uh, Kevin Knobloch, president of Ocean Grid, um, w I think a lot of the um, participants are wondering just how a planned grid system might be rolled out. Uh, we've heard about, you know, the, the benefits of it in the Brattle presentation, but how do you see this playing out in New York and uh, on what kind of a time frame do you think it's realistic? Thank you, Joe. It would help if I unmuted myself. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. And I thank Kirsty for, for terrific opening comments. I, I think the first thing I'd like to say is that uh, uh, the, the analysis that we're sharing today is, is really the kind of thing that I, many companies undertake as part of due diligence, when you, particularly when you're in, a, in, a, in an emerging marketplace. And um, we went to some of the best uh, outfits uh, in, in the business uh, and, and really hope that this will be a useful contribution uh, to the ongoing study and deliberation. And, and in saying that, I, we recognize, of course, that New York has very strong leadership in this space and has significant studies of uh, the transmission system underway. Uh, and, we're, and we're very eager to, to, to see those results when they come out. We, we really uh, uh, wanted to, to contribute to the public debate and, 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 and add, add some interesting information. The, the scenarios are, are illustrative. And as Walter described, they, they are based on on an informed uh, uh, set of set of uh, information that came forward, but it, it really is illustrative. It really intended to surface some of the key issues, and uh, it's the kind of thing that we can we can change assumptions and and see see how they change the results. And and I know that's 
that, that'll be the nature of, of, of other analyses ongoing. In terms of, of, of an approach to plan transmission in New York, first thing to say is New York has very strong leadership, as I said. You have a, you have a strong uh, com and committed governor um, with a state with, with now nation leading climate and clean energy goals, going back, Joe, to your time and, 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 uh, uh, and Julie's time in the government and coming to, uh, to, you know, to the present. Uh, and really a, a terrific uh, regulatory and policy making infrastructure in terms of very strong agencies. You have, uh, we're gonna hear from Tammy today from DPS, uh, strong energy office in NYSERDA, a single state ISO, which is not a trivial thing when you think about uh, New England ISO and then PJM to the south, far more complicated operations. And uh, New York is a very large economy, very large electric grid, but you have a single state ISO. Uh, New York Power Authority, uh, kind of a, a pretty unique uh, and, and focused and capable organization, and then utilities and so on. Uh, not to, and I should mention the commitment from the state legislature, of course. And an increasing uh, amount of attention on planned transmission. Um, and then most recently, of course, you, we, we have through the, uh, uh, the, the, the renewable siting law, uh, a, a new process for identifying priority bulk transmission projects and uh, further empowering the uh, uh, public policy transmission planning process to identify these and get these projects built. So the puzzle pieces are all there. They're all there and, and now they can be assembled into a coherent transmission plan that is going to de-risk these major elements that we saw and ensure that this 9,000 megawatt goal can be met in the, in the most cost-effective way. So let me just stop there for the moment. I, th I think it, it, the, the pieces are there, the leadership is there, the policies are there. It really is a matter of, uh, as, as this, the Brattle report surfaced, some really big challenges um, uh, working together to, to figure out now how we get ahead of those and remedy them. Thank you, Kevin. So this seems like a good time to uh, have Tammy Mitchell from uh, DPS weigh in. Uh, DPS was obviously tasked with a the monumental uh, role of looking at the entire system, uh, a piece of which is the offshore wind system and then the onshore components of that. And Tammy, could you just give us a, sort of an update on where DPS is and to the extent that you can share any thoughts about the you know, uh, planned versus a radial system uh, to the extent that you can talk about that, please feel free, but d d just start with a general update of where the PSC is on the study. Sure. Th thank you, Joe. And uh, thanks for uh, allowing me to be here today uh, on this panel and this webinar. I think this is uh, very timely. Um, as, as many have mentioned today, um, you know, given the state's ambitious clean energy goals and this nine gigawatt, uh, current nine gigawatt offshore wind target, there really is a need for, you know, coordinated and transparent planning processes uh, related to transmission. Uh, I think we all recognize that significant transmission infrastructure will be needed to facilitate the interconnection of the necessary renewables, uh, including offshore wind. Um, you know, this was recognized and is the basis for the Accelerated Renewable Energy Growth and Community Benefits Act. And as you all know, pursuant to that act, the PSC must develop a transmission investment plan, and that's for both um, bulk transmission system as well as the local transmission system. And so to inform those investment plans, uh, DPS, uh, along with NYSERDA and others, is undertaking the power grid study to identify cost-effective upgrades and investments uh, necessary for connecting renewable energy facilities and eliminating uh, electric system constraints. And of course, a key component of that study is the offshore wind transmission analysis. Um, and, and part of that analysis is uh, a consideration of offshore network configurations. So that, that study has been ongoing for some time now. Um, the, re, the final results of that study are due at the end of the year. Um, preliminary results will be available in the fall. 
And, um, you know, we expect that there will be a process for stakeholder input and engagement on the preliminary results. Um, I do appreciate the, the Brattle report today. You know, I, I, I think that, you know, we, we, it's important that we all have an eye on this and, and that we all work together in order to come up with the right answer because this, this is a, a, a big puzzle, I think, as Kevin noted. And, uh, you know, I think if we all work together on this, you know, we'll, we'll be able to fit the pieces together and make the best decisions, you know, for the state and for all of the, the players and ultimately for the, the ratepayers. Because, you know, as, as Brattle noted, you know, it, 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 there could be a difference in costs um, and efficiencies depending on, on how you approach that. So, you know, that's where we are. Um, you know, again, I can get more into some of the details of the study, but, uh, you know, I don't want to take up a lot of time. If there are specific questions, um, I'm certainly happy to answer those. Thanks very much, Tammy. Uh, we will come back to the questions. Uh, I do want to turn to Garish um, from the New York Power Authority. As I noted earlier, the Power Authority uh, was given uh, some new mandates or at least broadened authority under the uh, the recent laws and the power authority um, could have a significant role in the in the both uh, development and planning of offshore wind transmission so Garish, could you give us the uh, perspective from the power authority um, hi Joe. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, from a power from the power authority's perspective, uh, we really think of ourselves as enablers of the market to bring the market where it needs to be to support CLCPA and Eric CBA goals of 100 by 40 uh, renewable electricity uh, or carbon free electricity in that case, um, and. Our role really is to be an advisor to the DPS and NYSERDA as they're going through the studies and help you know, frame what the needs of the system look like in the long term. Uh, and when we say, you know, we look at ourselves as the market enablers, we are looking at public-private partnerships, looking at establishing partnerships with private developers, both on the offshore wind side and the offshore transmission, partnering with IOUs or private developers on the onshore transmission side to help integrate all of this into the larger grid. Obviously, you know, as NIPA, we bring a lot of uh, expertise in those areas, and we do believe that uh, there are problems that are best solved by the market. It's uh, how we can help them and enable them is uh, the bigger part or the bigger role that you want to play. Thank you, Garish. So, um, as I think about the transmission system from offshore to onshore, one of the big questions that keeps coming up is the sort of the, the regional nature of all of this. Uh, we've got projects and transmission coming from Massachusetts lease, lease areas. Uh, we could have it coming from New Jersey lease areas from, uh, of course, the new uh, wind energy areas that BOEM has under consideration right now. Uh, this is for anyone on the panel. How do we look at the, you know, the system as a whole and rationalize and make sense. And again, toward to the you know, Brattle presentation, make all of this as cost effective as possible uh, to make sure that you know, we keep project costs down, we, want, we promote competition in the process. Uh, how do we work with you know, other states in this process? And I will open it up to anybody who wants to take a crack at that. I'm happy to give the developer perspective um, and Please. maybe the, Euro the European piece. I mean, we would love to see the states working closely together. The benefits you get from the shared offshore system are realizable at scale. Whenever you're having smaller scale, then, then you are just taking on a lot of risk, uh, you know, on the specific projects or on a component of the grid. 
So the more you can share that risk across, you're going to realize those benefits, some of which have been outlined in the report. The other thing I would say that is unique to the US market and the particular situation we have is that you, we still don't know where power is coming from. We have a significant supply demand shortfall. So the number of leases across this whole Northeast region compared to the, the demand targets, particularly given Massachusetts recent increase, um, are really quite extreme. So even for us as a developer, it's, it's very, it's now becoming challenging in the US to work out which lease areas will contribute to which states, even which ISO or RTO regions, which is one of the concerns about balancing this planned transmission system at a state level rather than a regional level, because then otherwise the states are having to take a bit of a, in my language, a bit of a punt on what that system looks like. And therefore, you know, have we invested heavily in a, in a system that is therefore redundant because another state has gone and taken that project material. Um, so, so if you combined across, you take away that, that major risk. But again, there are, there are lots of barriers to, to doing that. But um, it, it, they've managed to do it in Europe. You know, the countries have worked together to define those standards. So it's completely possible and we can copy and paste from, again, some of the mistakes that were made early on in, in that process. Do others want to jump yeah, in on that question? Sure, I, I'll jump in uh, and completely agree with everything Christy said. The, the big challenge here is that uh, offshore wind wasn't on anybody's radar screen 10, 15 years ago. I'm talking about in terms of, of federal, regional, and state regulators uh, and, and uh, governmental agencies with authorities to help, help uh, design and build this system. And so we're, we're feel, feeling our way at each level. The states appropriately have taken a very strong lead in procuring uh, uh, offshore wind. Uh, but we, as we've seen, you, the, the, the key agency in the federal government, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, uh, is a cent, it's essential that they work closely with the states to, uh, to finalize identifying wind energy areas, holding leases of those wind energy areas, and, and moving these projects that receive state awards through the permitting process. And we, we've had a, a, a significant delay this year that it's really incumbent that, that, uh, that, that Boehm, Department of Interior, get back to regular order. U.S. Department of Energy has a policy lead in this space, but has been quiet uh, in, under this current administration, uh, potentially can be helpful. And in terms of states working together, uh, I, it, it, ultimately it, it, it would open up uh, uh, more opportunities to bring power to shore where it, where it makes sense at shorter distances, perhaps, perhaps, and and then wheel it through the system uh, uh, across state lines. That is particularly challenging because the the ISO uh, situation that we talked about. But it's it, the more we can 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 smooth that out, uh, the better. Ultimately, what we're looking for is an open access transmission system where there is maximum competition among not just generators, but transmission developers, and those can be generators, uh, since that's often part of their core competency, uh, or end utilities and others, but, but robust competition is what will, will ultimately uh, bring costs down and, and get this power to shore, uh, and, and if it's open, open access. Thank you, Kevin. So there are, um, We've obviously had a lot of legislative and uh, regulatory activity in the state. Um, is there anything else that needs to be done other than the proceeding that uh, the PSC is engaged in right now? Any changes in policy that are needed to, uh, so that we can ensure New York State gets to its goal of 70 by 30 and actually reaches the 9,000 uh, megawatt target. I don't know that there is, frankly. Uh, so I may have, I may be answering my own question, but uh, th there's just been so much activity. It's hard to keep your, it's almost hard to keep your head above water these days uh, because we're all being fed by a fire hose. Uh, and it seemed like the, the white paper in particular raised, you know, a whole series of questions, which many of you and I'm sure many of the participants on this, uh, this at this forum have responded to. Um, 
but what do you think are the major decisions that need to be, not necessarily changes in policy, but major decisions that need to be made uh, between now and you know, the next year or so to make sure again that New York keeps a pace of this 70 by 30 uh, target that we have and the 9,000 megawatt goal. And Tammy, maybe you want to take the take a crack at this since you're in the middle of it at the PSC. Sure. So as you pointed out, um, you know that there is a lot of activity uh, that's ongoing. Um, again, I, I go back to I, I think we need a good analysis so that we are moving in the right direction. And once we have information from you know our studies from from other studies that are out there. I think that will inform the commission uh, to develop a, a coordinated uh, transmission investment plan. Um, we're also working closely with the investor-owned utilities in the state, uh, along with NIPA and LIPA. Um, you know, we in this case we're talking about offshore wind. Um, but both offshore and onshore, there are going to be utility investments that are needed. Um, the utilities will need to look at their uh, planning and, and, and uh, uh, capital investment planning processes. Um, they've traditionally been involved in um, looking at projects for reliability or aging infrastructure, but I think now we have to introduce you know, public policy into their planning processes as well. Um, I'll, I'll mention, you know, Article 7, so, you know, the, the siting, um, I, I think there have been significant improvements as of late. Uh, we have a lot of projects that are moving through that process. They're uh, moving a little quicker. Um, we also have, per the legislation, a requirement to develop a, a nine-month expedited process, and we'll, we're working on uh, rules to do that and should be proposing those as uh, soon as well, but I would I would love to hear from others if anybody uh, is is aware of anything else that uh, we think is missing or uh, we should prioritize or as you mentioned any any major decisions that are are needed sooner rather than later. You know, I, I think everything um, and it's recognized uh, by the legislation by the governor that there's there's a need to move uh, quickly in order to achieve our targets and and I think it's all hands on deck to do that. Any responses to Tammy? What are they missing? I think it's a, I think Tammy outlines it really well. I think as, as everyone's mentioned, New York is, has the greatest need for, for shared transmission and is in the, the lead to, to deal with this. I think maybe less of a policy change, but what we'd benefit for before we got too far down this track is again, that kind of, some of that technical piece, the IEEE standards for offshore don't exist in the US, so it would be great to establish that so that we can actually connect multiple different wind farms into these shared infrastructures. Um, I think there's some of the ISO and market rules that could do with um, improving or, or finding another way around in order to achieve those public policy goals. It's something we as developers, both transmission and generation, are already struggling with. Um, and I can see this, this kind of shared transmission system only exacerbating those issues, uh, interconnection queue process rules, for example. So I think that kind of ISO marketplace and those technical standards, we could, we could add to that list of, of things that need to be done. On top, of course, the, well, how will it work and having that transparency on how actually we will procure those, uh, that shared infrastructure, presumably in some sort of phased or, or least regrets way. Um, and, and having that transparency early doors so, so no one prices in those risks. Joe, I, I would add that, uh, as I said earlier, I, I think the, the policy public puzzle pieces uh, are, are in place, that New York has, has really led the nation and showed the way how, 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 how a state kind of puts that policy uh, infrastructure ecosystem in place to tackle um, a dramatic decarbonization of the 
of, of the electric power system and a dramatic uh, growth of renewable energy. It, it really is in uh, now with those authorities that, that uh, the key agencies have moving forward and, and, and tackling some of the, the, these big challenges that uh, as, 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 as we keep echoing, a, a planned approach can, can really dive down on and, and, and address early on. We, this curtailment issue that surfaced in, in the analyses uh, was very interesting because it was there for both a planned and an unplanned system. So uh, as you get deeper into 9,000 megawatts, uh, there are some remedies we know of, battery storage, how far can that go in, in bringing those costs down? Uh, we looked at upgrades uh, into, into the uh, grid infrastructure. Uh, they're, they're expensive and they, they can help some. Uh, are there systems management um, uh, remedies that we can look at and so on? Certainly fully utilizing the existing uh, most robust uh, substations, points of, of, of interconnection. Uh, the, the narrows issue that surface is fascinating. It, we, you know, that's all, we need to get a lot of power into New York City and that's that's the, the gateway to the best substations is up through the narrows. That's an ideal uh, kind of public policy uh, project to figure that out and, and not leave it to a, a project by project approach that may well uh, underutilize that passage. Thanks, Kevin. So I'm, I'm trying to turn to the uh, long list of questions that have been piling up from participants. Um, one, Garish, is for you. It's would it be practical or advantageous for NIPA to directly contract for the generation and trans transmission and supply the offshore wind power directly rather than generation going to private utilities? That's uh, well, I can't, I can't, wait, I can't have, wait to hear this answer, uh, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we do have large-scale renewable procurement, uh, you know, that we have out in the market right now for onshore renewables. Uh, we do, you know, there's uh, there's always a potential that in the future, depending upon the, what we are called upon to support the state with, we may choose to do that. But then again, you know, we have to look at all the factors and whether it makes sense for our customers and New York rate payers to be able to bear those costs. Uh, you know, like every utility, even though, you know, we are a state agency, we are still accountable to our rate payers. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Garish. So uh, one thing we haven't broached yet is uh, that all of the transmission solutions are going to require substantial infrastructure. If uh, offshore, it's, uh, I, I, hesitate to use the word simpler because there, I guess there are, are less conflicts, but there certainly are conflicts with commercial traffic, commercial fishing, uh, just other ocean users. But there's certainly when those transmission lines come to shore, there is infrastructure required. Um, I wonder if a couple of you could just talk about what's being done to bring the public along so that they understand one the necessity of upgrading the transmission system and the uh, impacts that are likely to face communities that have to host some of these uh, uh, upgrades in transmission infrastructure how do we bring them along Kirsty, why don't you give us a, give it a crack and then we'll have others. Yeah, I just didn't want to be always the person that, that, that starts off. You'll get bored of hearing me, Joe, but it's a great question. Um, Not at all. I, I, I know I've got colleagues on, on the line who also speak and have a lot of experience onshore, but I, I appreciate we also are probably the world leaders in the offshore routing. Um, it's, a, it's, it's tough and I think however hard we try, I don't think we'll ever satisfy everyone. Um, so that's just a sort of first point. The processes for permitting and planning both offshore and onshore at the federal and state level in New York are extremely robust. Therefore that what we have to go through in order to demonstrate that a route both offshore and onshore and a landfall is the appropriate one is ex extremely rigorous, both in terms of 
impacts on local communities and the environment and we have to look at alternatives and do so obviously within the restrictions if we as a developer don't have eminent domain powers so we have to consider routes and real estate that is available for, for use uh, i think with with the existing projects there's a, a huge amount of stakeholder outreach that happens at the beginning of a project just at the concept phase throughout that permitting phase and then ongoing and we work with community leaders to establish community benefit funds to make sure that we, we, we consider how best to support the communities that we impact. Furthermore, we, we really take into account how and when we install those cables, so both from an environmental and community perspective. So for example, for some of our projects, or most actually, if it's a busy you know, beach area, we will of course avoid summer working and we'll only work in winter to, to make sure it's off season. Same for the environmental piece, avoid construction or installation during breeding grounds of, of critical, um, you know, benthic life, etc. So all of that is just sort of part, part and parcel of, of the, the way we go. Um, but I would say that, you know, we, we will face whichever model we use. Uh, this is huge, huge amounts of infrastructure, unprecedented change in the electricity system of one of the key communities globally with, you know, and, you know, this system is Con Edison's system. And, and from the very original, the first ever electric cable was installed in New York City. So the infrastructure is, you know, in, in places aging and there is huge amount of investment needed. So all communities, not just coastal, will be affected by the needs of those onshore and offshore upgrades. And there's probably a wider concerted effort as that we as part of that industry need to do to, to support that. Thank you, Kirsty. So, uh, uh, as, as Kirsty says, job one is outreach to the communities, to the counties, to the municipalities, to the towns, business community, labor, environmental community. That it, it this is a big change. Not to mention the commercial fishing industry, um, where where the the impacts uh, potentially are great and they can be mitigated. So that that's job one. Innovation, technological innovation is really allowing us to get more energy on fewer cables, uh, fewer platforms, uh, horizontal directional drilling allows us to come 50 feet underneath a beach with these cables and so on. So that's key. And, and I think probably maybe most important of all are, are trying to build local jobs, building a domestic supply chain of companies that can help make parts of these, this equipment, uh, be part of the, the concrete pouring and and uh, uh, and and the uh, the maintenance and, and the construction pieces as well. So, you've you've made a key point there. I think both of you have um, in terms of the you know the benefits of of these projects are also potentially huge. Um, Tammy, the Public Service Commission is going to come out with you know some of the preliminary recommendations soon uh, and then the end of the year will be on us before we know and you'll have a full-blown report with lots of recommendations including sort you know quote unquote the low-hanging fruit about uh, improvements and upgrades to the infrastructure to both local and and bulk distribution systems uh, and given the short timetables that are now built into the siting law how and what does the PSC plan to do to, again, help public understanding and hopefully support for the projects that have to proceed very quickly in order for New York to succeed? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, as you know, through any of our processes, there is, uh, you know, public input, um, you know, there will be comment periods, there will be technical conferences, but Again, you, you raise a good point that, you know, it, it's not just about uh, the utilities and the developers, um, you know, there's a huge aspect of this that is really uh, engaging and educating the public um, and, and doing outreach. So, um, you know, I, I can't speak to exactly what all the plans are as of yet, but that's certainly something that is going to happen. Thanks, Tammy. So uh, I'm going to note that we are at 11.31, um, a minute over time, um, and we still have lots and lots of questions. But um, I should probably 
uh, so we keep on the schedule and respect everybody's time. Thank uh, the panelists, um, Kevin, Kirsty, Derish, and Tammy. Uh, it's been a terrific discussion. Um, I hope the participants learned as much as I did. Uh, we have a, a, an enormous task ahead of us here, and I want to again thank the, the League and Ambaric and the Sabin Center for, for sponsoring uh, this forum because this is part of the process of educating people about what is underway in New York State and just how far we have to go and in a short amount of time. So with that, I'm going to turn the uh, the virtual podium back to Julie Tai for some closing remarks. Great. Thank you so much, Joe. And I want to echo what Joe said and thank um, our partners and Barrick and the Columbia Law School Saban Center, um, as well as our sponsor, Con Edison. Um, thank you, Joe, for moderating and all of our panelists for this great discussion today. We want to thank all of our participants for being here this morning, and we hope you learned a few new things about our grid and offshore wind transmission. Um, if you tuned in late or want to rewatch, this video will be on our YouTube page uh, at youtube.com backslash uh, NYLCV. Uh, we'll also be sending the materials and the recording in a follow-up email to everyone who registered for the event. Um, as I mentioned earlier today, we are, this is the first in our series on the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. So stay tuned for more forums like this one as we start touching on transportation, on buildings, on manufacturing, on, on uh, nature and agriculture. Um, I would encourage you to follow us on at NYLCV on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram for updates. And if you're not already on our mailing list, we encourage you to sign up at www.nylcvef.org. Um, thank you again to everyone, and we hope you stay healthy and safe out there. And have a great day. Thank you, Julie.